we're here with Adrian from Casa of Will County, that's Court Appointed Special Advocates. Um, Adrian, could you tell us a little bit about what CASA does? Of course, I'd be happy to. So CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates, as you say. And what we do is that we recruit and train volunteers to be the voice of these children who come into care due to abuse and neglect. So you, uh, your advocates will accompany them to court, correct? Um, a variety of things. So usually, typically what our advocates will do is they'll go through these trainings and they'll, they'll be trained to be a, a volunteer. And then once they do that, they're assigned their case and they meet with these children once a month and they report back to the judge on the well-being of the child and kind of help the judge um, in their recommendations on what, how to go further in the case. Okay. So if someone wants to volunteer for CASA, what kind of training would they go through? So we have a very rigorous training, as you know, um, working with uh, children in the system. You will need to go through uh, deep background checks through DCFS. And then we have our own personal training. It's 33 hours. And our staff puts a very great training together, talking about the different um, things they might see in their field. Um, and then to sign up to volunteer, um, you can go on our website, which is just casaofwillcounty.org. Um, you can fill out an application, and then we'll just do a quick interview. Great. Well, thank you for all the work uh, that you do on behalf of our children. I know it's a scary, uh, scary process going through the court process, and we're glad that we have advocates like you helping them through. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, we are here with Sharon with Moms Against Action, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her organization. Hi. Yes, so Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America was started the day after Sandy Hook by our founder, Shannon Watts. So now it's been five years since, since Moms Demand Action was started, and we have over four million supporters all across the country. We have chapters in every state, and we advocate for common sense gun laws to be passed at the state level as well as the national level. Right now, nationally, what we're looking to, to uh, try to pass is our actually we're trying to stop what's considered the concealed carry reciprocity agreement meaning if one state has very lenient or lax laws regarding who can purchase a gun meaning sometimes you don't even need a permit but as in states like Illinois you need a background check you need a permit you need a concealed carry permit so those are the types of laws we try to stop now, what, try, what laws we try to advocate state by state are laws which are considered either EROP, which is Emergency Restraining Order Protection, or Lethal Violence Order Protection, which means that if someone is a threat to themselves or others, a person can, and who owns a firearm, a family member then can go to the police. The police will then go before a judge, and the judge will deem whether that person's firearms should be taken away temporarily. If, he, if that is the case, then that particular person is then, or in Illinois, is then ordered to go to see a psychiatrist, and then after a 30, 60, 90 day period, I'm not really sure what the period is, depending what state you're in, then that person can go back and ask the judge for his, fi for his or her firearms back if the psychiatrist feels they are deemed safe enough to have them back. And the main reason why this passed in Illinois was because that Waffle House shooting, that person was from Illinois, and the firearms were given to his father, and it was his father who decided to give him back those firearms. So now it's the police who will take control of the firearms. It won't be a family member. So it'll help keep everyone safe, because on the average month in our United States, there are 50 women who are shot and killed by their former or, or current partner. Yeah. So if someone wants to support your organization or get involved with your advocacy efforts, how can they do that? Well, there's an easy way they can do it. They can text READY to 64433 or go to momsdemandaction.org or everytownforgunsafety.org. Great. Thank you so much. Thank All right. Thanks so much. We're here with Andrea from Prairie State Legal Services, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her organization. Hi, my name is Andrea Detellis. I'm the managing attorney with Prairie State Legal Services. We are um, a nonprofit. We're basically a civil legal aid that provides assistance free of free of charge to eligible clients. And we cover my office covers just Will and Grundy counties, but we cover 36 counties in northern and central Illinois. 
And a lot of, what a lot of people don't know is that in criminal law, you are entitled to an attorney, but in civil law, that's not the case. So that's where we step in. And for eligible clients, we provide services in almost every area. I say in civil, there are some days. But we, we really try and focus on um, individuals that are at serious risk of harm and also individuals that need their basic human needs met. So think about family law, orders of protection, divorce cases, your parentage cases, um, public benefits, some of those basic like you know you're going to be without <laughs> some basic necessities, housing law, people facing eviction, people facing discrimination, education, um, people that need IEPs, people that are being expelled, um, criminal records work, oh goodness, I mean I could go on with a lot that we do. So we do a lot in civil. And what makes a person eligible to receive your services? Um, it sometimes will depend, a lot of times it will depend on income. We are partially funded by the federal government, by Legal Services Corporation. So they have a lot of different guidelines for which they set. So there are some income eligibility um, requirements, but we also have some separate funders where, for instance, we have um, a VOCA grant where we do not have income guidelines for that. And that is for um, victims of, of crime. So that comes into a lot of our order of protection cases, which is, you know, we're here tonight for Take Back the Night, so that um, we get a lot of cases in the area of domestic violence a lot. So if someone needs representation, how can they get in contact with your office? Well, we actually, we just moved. Our new location is 18 West Cass Street, fifth floor in Joliet, um, and they would call our they would call our number. Um, we are actually transitioning phones, so I'd say starting Tuesday, October 9th, they would call 815-727-5123. Well, thank you so much for the work that you do for our community. Thanks. All right. Hi, we're here with Kelly from Bridges for a New Day. Kelly, can you tell us a little bit about your agency? We're a small nonprofit counseling agency that opened 15 years ago. We started in Lockport. We're now in Romeoville, Illinois. Um, we have programs that reach into the schools in our area. We have a domestic violence program. We also do parenting and we have a low cost program in case clients don't have insurance. So if a client wants to uh receive counseling from your agency? Are there any restrictions? Are there any eligibility? Um, restrictions? No, we do not um, counsel batterers. We do refer them out. Um, but other than that, no, there's no age restriction, no insurance restriction. You know, we're there to help. Great. And how can people get in touch with you? Oh, they can definitely go to our website, which is bridges to a new day.org or they can call 815-838-2690. Well, I'm so glad we have a resource like you in our community. We're Thank happy you. to be there. Thank you. Thanks. We're here with Laura from Will County Now. Laura, can you tell us what NOW stands for? Uh, it is the National Organization for Women. Okay. And what does this organization do? Um, we have six basic principles that we work on. Um, reproductive justice. Um, we work with LGBTQIA um, folks to ensure their civil rights. We work to ensure immigration rights for women. Um, and basically anything that has to do with ensuring that women have equality in society. And uh, if someone wants to support your mission or get involved with Will County Now, how can they do that? Uh, very simple. We have a Facebook page, Will County Now, and you can just go on there. We have a closed page and we have an open page. And you can ask to be part of the organization, and we meet once a month on a Thursday in Lockport. And um, we have a lot of work to do. We certainly have a lot of work to do, especially in these times. <laughs> Well, we appreciate you speaking out for the cause of women, and uh, now has been around for a long time, hasn't it? Yes, yeah, since 1966, it was started by uh, Betty Friedan and, and um, um, just a whole group of folks that were fighting against, in the beginning, um, the EEOC not um, ensuring women's equality in advertisements for jobs. And that was the premise of how the organization started. And it's really grown since then. Yeah. How long has the Will County chapter been around? We've existed for about three years. It did exist several years ago and kind of faded. Um, and then we started it up about three years ago. Um, and we are very active. We work with Guardian Angels on some things. And we have put together a really wonderful new program called the Off to, uh, Off to College Now Safety Fair. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of assault that happens to college students. Um, most of it happens, or it tends to happen, before Thanksgiving of a freshman student's year because they're new to college, they're going to parties and what have you. And so what we wanted to do was make sure that 
we gave them the tools that they needed, um, both uh, boys and girls, so that they could stay safe at school and also so that they understand what consent is, that no means no. And you may have gotten a yes before, but when they say no, that means no. And how not to be a bystander. Well, thank you so much for everything you do for our community and, and speaking out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We're here with Stephanie from an organization called Rise from the Ashes that provides pro bono legal services to women. Can you tell us a little bit more about your organization? Uh, Rise from the Ashes is actually born out of my own experience of needing a divorce and not being able to find a lawyer and get out of a domestic violence situation. So I found one and we turned around and founded Rise from the Ashes and all of our clients come from the local domestic violence shelters. We give them pro bono legal services so that they can get divorced, get custody of their kids, and truly be free of these situations. Are there certain eligibility? Does Could anybody use your services? All of our clients come as referrals from women who are working with the shelters in some capacity. So they are attending support groups, they are a shelter resident, they are attending counseling, and they are typically living at or near the poverty line. So these are really women who are making strides to better their lives and just can't really afford to sever those legal ties. Okay. So usually these are women who are already receiving services from another agency such as Guardian Angel and then they partner with you to get the legal services that they need, right? Yes, shelters have amazing advocates but they don't always have a whole legal department so we try to fill that gap for them. Great. Well we're so glad that you do, we're so glad that you're working here in our community. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. We're here with Sandra. Sandra is the lead counselor at Guardian Angel Community Services Sexual Assault Services Center. Sandra, can you tell us a little bit more about what your agency provides a lot of different services? Can you tell us a little bit about each one? Oh, sure. Um, we have different services, and I'm just going to put this to kind of cue me. Um, but one of the departments that I work with is the sexual assault services. We have um, advocacy in the courthouse as well as um, hospital advocacy, and then we offer the counseling to significant others as well as to victims. Um, in addition, we have like the domestic violence, of course, this is the whole event for that, um, and they serve the community as well. Um, APS, which is Adult Protective Services. We have Susie's Caring Place, which is a transitional living. Um, PAPE, which is the Partner Abuse Program, and Foster Care. I know I'm missing some, but that's some of the programs that we have. We have so many of them. And I understand that your advocates will go to a hospital if a woman has been a victim of sexual assault and needs to undergo a kit, um, they will be there with them and explain the whole process? Yes, um, they, they, they come in and they serve the whole family if somebody's there with the person. Um, but basically it's there from the beginning to the end and we even explain um, their rights as a patient, as a client as well as offer them the services and give them information as to what's going to happen follow up and how they could seek those services. So uh, I understand you have a 24-hour hotline. Um, what can people, what kind of services can people get when they call that hotline? What can they expect? Well, when we get calls, it could be anything from somebody that's activated or triggered about memory. So we give them counseling, crisis counseling over the phone. Um, court advocacy, hospital advocacy, as well as somebody needing services or not knowing how to help their um, significant other. So we get everything. I could give you that number. If you yeah, know. what's the number? <laughs> it's 815-730-8984. Great. I should memorize it next time. <laughs> Thank you so much for everything that Guardian Angel does. You guys have been in the community a long, long time and uh, are really a cornerstone partner with Take Back the Night. So thank, thank you. you. We're here with Joliet Mayor Bob Odekirk and City Councilman Don Dickinson. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for being here and supporting this event tonight. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about why Take Back the Night is important to you? Well, Take Back the Night's been a great annual event. Um, it's great to see it here at Joliet Central. The Zonta Club does a great job. There's a lot of good organizations out here. So I think it's important as elected officials that we show support for the cause and, and, and uh, against domestic violence towards women. Every, every year you can count on us to be out here. We're 100% we're with this. And you know you couldn't pick a better facility to have it at. <laughs> yes. Julia Central has been incredibly accommodating. It's a beautiful building. We're lucky to be here. I also have to commend the Joliet Police Department for helping us uh, with crowd control and traffic control. Uh, we're very lucky to have the support of the city. Excellent. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We are here with the National Hookup of Black Women, and Denise, can you tell us a little bit about your organization and the literacy program you have? Certainly. Our organization is 
totally dedicated to helping and support the community. Every dime that we raise goes into programs in the community. We have our Passport for Success, which focuses on children 11 to 17 years of age. We have our reading rooms in a number of places around the city. The books are free to anyone, adults or children. We take books in English or Spanish, so if you want to give us donations, we're happy to take those. We give those out at different fairs. People can take as many as they want. So that's available to you. We also do a number of projects in the community between blessing tables, food pantries, and those kinds of things. We are here to serve. We are a service organization throughout the country, actually. We are the Joliet chapter, but we are a national organization, and our mission is service. We are about serving the community in the ways that we can. And if someone wants to make a donation of books to your organization, how can they do that? They can make that donation by calling us, and we can come pick them up or they can arrange to drop them off. Beginning this weekend, we'll be located in the old Oak Valley School, which is at 1705 South Richard Street in the Sugar Creek area. So people can drive over there, bring the books, and just leave them. If they want a receipt for a tax credit, we can arrange for that for them. They can call up any club member and arrange to drop them off and get a receipt. They can also go to our webpage, nhbw.inc and look up when our hours are and arrange to contact us so that we can pick up the books for them. We are happy to have any kind of donation. It doesn't have to be books. You can also give us money. We can always make use of that. And we are starting a new Dress for Success program. So if you have gently worn clothing that someone who is re-entering the workforce might be able to use, we would be happy to take those items as well. If you have dresses, suits, whatever, shoes, Please bring those same address, 1705 South Richard Street. We would be happy to have whatever you can give us to help us promote our programs. Sounds like I need to go clean out my closet. <laughs> That's a good Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. We're here with Catherine and Mary from the Julia Area Zonta Club to tell us a little bit about their program, Zonta Says No. Uh, what, does this, what does your organization do? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, our organization is, exists to be able to promote the, the strength of women and to be able to partner with agencies throughout the community to uh, make sure that women feel that they have a voice in every regard. So for this particular campaign, at the end of November into early December, there's 16 days where Zanta, as an organization, makes sure that the community has access to the words that our community members feel that the women and the adults in our community need to know about knowing that you are not alone. For any victim of domestic violence, we want to make sure that they know that they are not alone. And so this whole campaign is to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to share their words, take a picture in front of our orange lady who's scattered throughout the community during those 16 days, and to uh, make sure that everybody feels that their words are shared. So. And Mary, uh, what else does Zonta Club do throughout the year other than the Zonta Says No campaign? Well, we have um, service projects. We partner up with different agencies within the community um, and assist them with um, assisting women um, and their children um, and helping them get back on their feet. So um, that's the goal of Zonta is to advance the status of women and to empower women. And just to add a, just a little bit to what Catherine was saying about Zanta Says No, I just want to say it's not just a local project, it is a worldwide project. Zanta is part of an international organization and um, um, clubs throughout the world are doing this campaign. So. Now you ladies are easy to spot today. You're all wearing orange and usually we're in, a, we're in a sea of purple. Usually the purple is the color associated with domestic violence. Can you tell us why Zonta decided to use the color orange for this campaign? Orange is the color for determination and the color for endurance. All right. Well, I, I feel you, you ladies are very determined. Thank you so much for being here and supporting us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. We are here with Will County State's Attorney James Glasgow and State Representative John Connor, who is also a former Assistant State's Attorney with the Will County State's Attorney's Office. Gentlemen, thank you for, so much for being here. Uh, we are celebrating our 22nd annual Take Back the Night rally, but Jim, you were here when it first started, right? Yes, uh, I remember Herman Haas, who was the Chief Judge at the time. We were out and we, were, we had candles, but we were walking in the dark and nobody was quite sure what the route was, and, uh, but it, it, it turned out pretty nice. And, uh, 
but it's, it's certainly grown over the years, and we've been to a lot of different locations, but I cannot believe how gorgeous the rotunda is here. Really? It is, whoever the architect was, this is a, this is 100%. Yes, we are very fortunate to be yeah. at, at Joliet Central High School this year. And John, why do you support Take Back the Night? You've been coming to this event for many, many years. Why is it so important to you? Well, you know, as a prosecutor, obviously I handled cases of domestic violence. And then, of course, the big case that Jim and I did together was the Drew Peterson case, a case of domestic violence. So, uh, you know, so throughout my career, and obviously throughout Jim's career as well, we've been trying to protect women. So. Coming to take back the night uh, is just a natural extension of that and trying to further that end of keeping women and children safe in the communities. Well, we appreciate both of you, how hard you work, how fight, hard you fight for women in our community to keep them safe. And thank you for supporting our, our well, Let's event. not quite end yet because I've got a check for you, Katrina. Oh, do you? I make a can contribution annually to this effort. And uh, so there's a $500 check. Thank that you. Obviously, you can go to a very good cause. Yes. The money that we raise from our sponsors goes to, uh, you know, first off, fund this event, uh, fund the, the costs associated with it. We also sponsor a scholarship uh, for a young woman who's a victim of uh, intimate partner abuse who is awesome. working to further her education. So this will go to good use. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Take you, Katrina. We are here with Nicole from the Victim Witness Department of the Will County State's Attorney's Office. Nicole, can you tell us a little bit about what your organization does? So in Victim Witness Services, our job is to make sure that victims have access to all the information and resources and support services that they have a right to. So when a woman comes through the uh, court system, they will get in contact with your office and you'll offer them support? Yeah, and they come in multiple ways. Sometimes people do walk-ins, call-ins, and then most often we get every new case that comes to the door that is of a violent nature or has any type of victimization, it's automatically assigned to our department and then we reach out and make sure they have access to all that information. And women who are victims of crime, they have certain rights through the state, is that correct? That is correct, yep. And uh, can you explain a little bit what, but what that is and how you connect them with what they are entitled to? So there is the Illinois um, Rights of Crime Victims and Witnesses Act and that kind of governs everything that our Victim Witness Services does, at least at the base of it. We try to be as comprehensive as possible and expand from there and use best practices. Um, however, it's basic rights, like the right to be treated with fairness and dignity and respect, the right to have their safety concerns taken into consideration throughout the process, be kept as safe as reasonably possible, to be kept informed, to communicate with the prosecution, to apply for crime victim compensation, um, to submit documentation for restitution, and, and, and many others as well. Well, thank you for all the work that you do. Um, I'm, you're working with women who are in a very scary, very confusing time of their life, and the court system can be very intimidating. Um, so I'm, they rely very heavily on people like you. Thank you. You know, I'm very grateful to do the work. Um, our office has really been building a very um, comprehensive victim witness services team. Thank you. Thanks to the uh, state's attorney as well. He really has um, taken up the cause and helped us build our program. Well, we're grateful for the work you do, and thank you for being here thank tonight. You. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to the 22nd annual Will County Take Back the Night. My name is Quinn Adamowski, and this is Tyler Markham. We are honored to stand before you tonight as two of the members of the Will County Take Back the Night Committee. Before we begin, please take a moment and silence your cell phones. At this time, we would ask that everybody stand so that the Boy Scouts can present colors.
We would first like to, oh, I'm sorry, have a seat. <laughs> we would first like to recognize all of our fellow committee members who put in hard work to make this, who put in hard work to make this a successful event every year. If our fellow committee members could please stand to be recognized. We'd like to take some time to acknowledge our sponsors for this year's event. Our event sponsors, the $1,000 donation, Holly Club of Joliet, and Anonymous. Platinum sponsors, $500 donations, include Darcy Automobiles, Harris & Harris Limited, President St. Joseph Medical Center, Silver Cross Hospital, and Will County State's Attorney James Glasgow. Our gold sponsors, at $250 donations, Joliet Junior Women's Club, Rob Baker Ford, the Plainfield, and the Zonta Club of Joliet area. Our silver sponsors at $100 donations, Andrea Lynn Chastine, Will County Circuit Clerk, Anonymous, Cheryl McCarthy, District 204 Superintendent, Coldwell Banker, the Real Estate Group, Shelby Hammond and Bonnie Horn Brokers, Jody Wartenberg, Joliet Junior College, Joliet Junior College Student Nurses Association, Joliet Public Library, Mark Batnick, Illinois State Representative, Natalie Manley, Illinois State Representative, National Hookup of Black Women, Pat McGuire, Illinois State Senator, Prairie State Legal Services, Ray Solomon, Mayor of Prest Hill, Village of Romeoville, and Zeta Phi Beta Sorority. We'd also ask that you reference the program book for our in-kind sponsors as well. Uh, we'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge some of uh, our uh, guests who are in attendance tonight. Uh, Quinn is on the District 86 School Board, and I'm on the Will County Board. Uh, we had Lori McPhillips, who's a candidate for Will County Clerk, Dr. Cheryl McCarthy, who's the superintendent for District 204, uh, John Connor, state representative in the 85th District, Ray Solomon, mayor of Crest Hill, Andrea Chaste Chastine, clerk of the circuit court, uh, Judge David Garcia, who's also running for circuit court, Tracy Spasia, who's on the District 204 school board, uh, Larry Walsh, our Will County executive, uh, Dave Scarupa, who's on the Joliet Township High School Board, Lauren Staley Ferry, who's a county board member and candidate for clerk, uh, Bob Odekirk, mayor of the city of Joliet, uh, Judge Victoria McKay Kennison, who's also on the ballot for uh, circuit judge, Don Duck Dickinson, who's a Joliet City Councilman, Denise Winfrey on the county board, uh, Jim Allison, who's running for the Joliet Township High School Board, uh, Beth Ann May, who's the Joya Township Clerk, and Jim Glasgow, our Will County State's Attorney. So if you could all join me in welcoming them. And if we missed anybody, blame Quinn. Um, Quinn and I are here because uh, domestic violence is oftentimes referred to as a woman's issue. But we can't solve violence against women if men don't treat women with respect. Respecting others, especially women, is a learned behavior. Quinn and I are here because it's time for men in this room and men in this community to take responsibility and say no more violence, no more abuse. We the men throughout the community must stop, step up and teach each other and show our brothers, sons, nephews, friends, and all men how to treat women how to be respectful of one another, and how to be good human beings. So with that, I'd like to welcome our two co-chairs for this year's event to the podium. Let's get my papers out of their way. Good evening. I am Cherry Powell, and uh, this is Jean Turnick, and we are the co-chairs for 2018, and we have a special presentation right now.
Each year, we honor someone in the community who has gone over and above for Take Back the Night. This year, we would like to honor Mike and Kathy Trisna, owners of Chicago Street Bar and Grill, who for the past 10 years has hosted Will County Circuit Clerk's fundraiser for Take Back the Night. So Mike and Kathy, if you could come up. Our committee member, Lynette Shea, will come up. The, the fundraiser that the Will County Circuit Clerk has been putting on for the past 10 years is an amazing fundraiser and um, And Lynette's going to say a word about that. Mm -hmm. Domestic violence in the Will County Circuit Clerk's Office hits close to home. Um, our clerks see it in the courtrooms, doing OPs and the family court call, and it touches some of us in our office personally. And so we have kind of taken on domestic violence as a flagship cause for our office. And we'd, I'd like to introduce our circuit clerk, Andrea Chastine, and some of our staff members would like to present the check for the money that we raised at our fundraiser that we did back in September. did a great job on explaining the reasons why we wanted to partner up with Will County Take Back the Night. Um, this is our 10th year and we want to keep partnering and keep moving forward to make sure that we are raising money to go back to the community to help the victims um, in, our, in our community. Um, we have been able to successfully run fundraise this year, 5,000 $242. I know in the brochure it says $5,202, but one of our judges last week just gave us another $40 check. So, well, so we changed that. So hopefully the next time that we can actually come up here, we want to make sure that we can actually tell you guys that in the 10 years so far that we have been doing this, we are at $45,174 that we have helped contribute towards Will County Take Back the Night and all of the agencies and advocates that help individuals. So hopefully next year when we come up here, we will be over that $50,000 mark. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now Katrina Crown will come up. Good evening, everyone. My name is Katrina Nolan. I've been a member of this committee for eight years now. Um, it's always a very important event. Um, the, the check from the Will County uh, Circuit Clerk's Office, the sponsors that you heard read earlier uh, this evening and who are listed in your program, uh, we could not put on this event without them. Uh, they help us cover the costs of uh, renting the facility, all the different costs associated with putting on tonight's event. Um, and it also helps to uh, pay for a scholarship that is awarded to a, a woman who is a survivor of intimate partner violence and who is seeking to further her education. Uh, so this year, it's my extreme pleasure to announce that uh, our scholarship is being presented to a woman named Kate Pook. 
Um, Kate cannot be with us tonight as she is actually furthering her education. Uh, she has class tonight and she didn't want to miss. So uh, kudos to Kate for being so committed to her, to her education, but I want to um, share with you a little bit about her. Uh, Kate's an extraordinary individual, and I couldn't think of anybody who's more deserving of this scholarship. She's one of the most selfless and nurturing people that I've ever, ever met. Um, Kate raised four children, two of whom have special needs. Her daughter has severe mental and medical challenges and is unable to drive. So Kate was, is actually her main source of transportation, whether it's to, to and from doctor visits, to and from work, and actually drove her uh, while her daughter pursued her bachelor's degree, drove her to school every night. Um, Kate, her son has autism and was unable to attend a, tra a traditional classroom. So Kate homeschooled him for nine years. Uh, she's also a caretaker to her parents and drives 200 miles each week to tend to their medical and their personal needs. And in the midst of all of this, Kate finds time to care for an ill family member who's in a nursing home. She assists her elderly housemate with the shopping and the gardening, and she also volunteers her time to visit elderly shut-in people. After 22 years in an abusive relationship, Kate found the courage to leave her abuser. Uh, she writes, I was raised by a narcissistic mother and an alcoholic father to be as subservient as one person could be. I was raised to feel that constant abuse was normal. I was faced with a family to raise and a severely abusive husband. I was completely devoted to my children, and I felt I owed them a debt to give them the best, the benefit of every opportunity available to reach their maximum potential. On September 11, 2017, I began as a resident at the Groundwork Domestic Violence Shelter. I believed my condition was unfixable that I would never be able to care for myself and recover from a lifetime of mental, emotional, psychological, sexual, physical, and financial abuse. Yet, I have surpassed my greatest expectations in the pursuit of my recovery, and I know there is more to come. Kate's dream is to become a registered nurse. Last spring, she graduated as a certified nursing assistant, and she's currently attending Joliet Junior College, where she maintains a 4.0 GPA, and is a member of the Phi Theta Kappa Nursing Honor Society. Kate's friend Vicki writes, Kate has passed through more barriers than, that have been put in her way, and Kate has overcome each one. She is not one to be defeated and continues on in spite of what challenges are presented to her. Kate is a rare individual. There are not many who persevere to the degree that she has for her whole life. So at this time, I would like to invite Kate's daughter, Erica, up to the stage to accept a small token of our appreciation on her behalf and to let her know how much we admire her courage and we wish her all the best. Hello, my name is Amira Abu Yusuf, and I am one of the Will County Take Back the Night Committee members. It is my absolute honor to introduce this evening's speaker. Each year as a committee, we put a lot of careful thought into what story we want to share with you all. We try to find stories that will inspire you, inspire you to speak up, to take action, or get help. Alicia Guerrero lived through what can only be described as an unimaginable nightmare. However, for far too many people in this room, it is a horrible reality every day. By bearing witness to Alicia's fierce strength, and you are also going to take time to sit in her pain. But through this pain, we're hoping that you'll find inspiration to talk about domestic violence with your community. So please help me in welcoming Alicia to the stage. My name is Alicia Guerrero.
and I'm going to share my story with you tonight. This isn't my story alone, but one that I share with someone very special to me. <sighs> was no longer here to tell it. She was my 15-year-old daughter, and her name was Brianna Valle. I want to start off by telling you a little bit about who Brianna was. She was such a good baby and the sweetest little girl. <laughs> I could have ever asked for. When she was little, she loved playing with dolls and dressing up in her Disney princess dresses. She was shy and quiet, but she was always in tune to what was going on around her. When she was about 12, she began to come out of her shell. She tried new looks and styles and began to find new groups in school. She had grown into a beautiful young woman with dreams and hopes of happiness. She loved music, makeup, fake eyelashes, hoop earrings, and going to the mall. Anyone who knew her could tell you how awesome and free-spirited she was. She had big, beautiful eyes and the biggest smile that would make your dark. That would make your darkest days brighter once. She had this loud laugh I will never forget. She was truly one of a kind. This is a long story and I have a lot of time. I don't have a lot of time to tell it. So bear with me and I will try to squeeze it all in. When I was 17, I had Brianna and two and a half years later, I had her brother just Jesse. I married their father and we struggled just like any other marriage, but it was important for me to keep us together. We lived in a bad area with gangs, drugs, violence, and teen, a lot of teen pregnancies. We did whatever we had to do to keep them safe and shield them from it all. I worked the day shift and their father worked the night shift so that they were always supervised. When we would go out, I would drive out of our neighborhood to a safer one and we would spend a lot of time with my family in Joliet. In seventh grade, I noticed Brianna, I noticed her and her friends change and it began to affect her academically. We wanted better for her, so we enrolled her in a private school that was across the street. There she would have more supervision and stricter rules. A month before Brianna's 13th birthday, we decided to give her a cell phone she had been asking for, which made her very happy. Now I know that would become her way of connecting to the outside world. We tried to shield her from. She wasn't allowed to have social media accounts, and she wasn't allowed to have boyfriends. She found a way to access an old Facebook account I made and used, used it to talk to some of her friends. On that account, she would meet a man who would eventually convince her to leave her family and run away with him. I had no idea what was going on until one Friday. One Friday morning, she walked out of the front door and didn't come back. It was my day off, so it was my turn to take them to school. When Brianna walked out the front door, I thought it was to get something from the dryer, not to run away. When she didn't return, I ran outside only to find she was gone. My neighbor who was sitting outside told me he saw her walking down the street with two backpacks. I ran back inside and found a note on her bed. It said that she had gone with a friend, that she was okay, that she was thankful for all that we did for her, and that she loved us very much. I called 911 and I drove around the neighborhood crying and praying for her return. The police seemed unalarmed. They said it was the weekend and she was probably going to a party. And when she was done, she would return. I couldn't believe they didn't care. I had to do something. I had to find her. I started with the businesses on the corner since that was the direction she was headed. I had, I asked to see footage around the time she had left and any text messages she had made, but was told the police would need to be contacted. We made flyers with her, with her picture and contact information at a local print shop and began distributing them in my area. 
I was able to get a printout of her calls, so I called the numbers she had last contacted. A few people answered, but they all denied being with her and knowing where she was. We drove around all day and all night for a week with no luck. Every day I called the detectives and every day I heard the same thing, nothing. It was truly a parent's worst nightmare. I decided to do more digging and checked a laptop she normally used. I found my old Facebook account and reset the password. When I logged in, I noticed she had been using it and was talking to people. She had friended someone who had told her his name was Carlos and he lived in Cicero. He asked if she wanted to hang out with him or to go to his house and watch movies. He also asked her how old she was. She didn't answer, but instead asked him. He replied and said he was 16. She then lied and said she was 15, when she was actually a month shy of turning 14. He left his phone number and that was it. I called the number, but there was no answer. His Facebook account was full of gang writing and no pictures of himself, but one of his back as he threw up gang signs. There was a video of him and his friend trying to kill a fly in their window with a fly killer. I tried to see if I recognized any of the buildings outside the window they hung out of, but I didn't. I went back to the cell phone company and I asked for more printouts and I found that she had been using her phone. I called, I called the phone numbers and again, no help. I asked if they could tell me what cell tower her phone was pinging off of and they agreed. She was in Cicero. I went home and printed out the area and went looking. As I drove around, I was able to find the buildings outside of the window they hung out of across from, across from there were apartments. There was only one window at the top with no curtains and I knew that was it. We sat outside the building all night and then it happened. My daughter came to the window. I knew it was her. I called the police, but they came too late. She had already left through another exit. The next day, I went, back to the, I went back and I was able to see video footage of her in that building with a guy. I went to the apartment she was in and I threatened to call the police if the guy there didn't tell me where she was. He panicked and took me down the alley to where his friend lived and told me she was with him. I again contacted the police and the next day, Brianna was found and I was able to bring her home. I was so happy she was alive and unharmed. She was very upset and worried that he would get into trouble. I didn't know much about him, but that he was 21. He went by different names and he had many phone numbers. I tried to have him arrested for kidnapping, but was told he didn't kidnap her. She left willingly. I tried to get him for statutory rape, but couldn't. She had to admit they were intimate and she wouldn't. There was nothing I could do. I got her into therapy and we watched her like a hawk. I took away all electronics so that she wasn't able to talk to him. I put bars on our windows in the house and locked the door and a lock on the door that would keep us in. He would call me and text me all the time wanting to talk to her and I demanded he stopped, but he wouldn't. I went to the police many times and made police reports, but nothing ever happened. I was upset that nothing was being done to stop him. The police advised me to get an order of protection. I went to court multiple times, but he was never served. Brianna by then was in a private all-girls high school and continued therapy. Every time I thought things were getting better, something else would happen. He wouldn't go away. When times were good, I would give her some freedom by dropping her and her friends off at the mall Friday after school. When they were done, I would pick them up and take everyone home. I had no idea what was really going on at the mall. He would be there waiting for her. I had, no, I had later found out that she was using her friend's cell phones in the school to keep in contact with him and there was nothing that I could do. The school could only do so much. I stopped her from going to the mall when we had suspicions, which made things worse. We had just come back from another court appearance for an order of protection when the school called and said she walked out and told a friend they were running to Mexico. I called the police and had them contact his friend and she was returned immediately. 
I didn't understand why she was ruining her whole life for him. He didn't love her, I did. He would continually manipulate her to leave with him. He would threaten to cheat if she didn't. He would tell her things like how much he needed her, and if she didn't leave, he would kill himself. She didn't know what to do. She wanted to be with him, but she also knew she needed to stay with her family. At one point, she did what a lot of girls did. She lied and said she was pregnant. She thought this would keep him, and it did until I found out. I made her call him and tell him she lied. He didn't believe her. He thought I made her have an abortion. I told him there was no baby and that there never was and to leave her alone. It had gotten so bad that I was told she had to leave her school. They could not watch her the way that she needed to be watched and it worried them when he took her that it would happen again. She became so depressed. She would sit. She would sit in her room in the dark and cry. She wouldn't eat, and when she did, she would throw it up. I was so worried, so I told her we need, we need to get her more help. She agreed, and we went to a mental health facility. She was admitted that night. After she shared with them, she had taken high doses of NyQuil <laughs> to see what would happen. I cried and pleaded for them not to make her stay, but I knew it was the best thing for her. She needed help. While she was there, she was communicating with him. When I found out, I had them lock her calls. She was put on depression medication and released three months later. Things seemed better, but they weren't. The cycle would continue until we decided we had to leave. We needed to get her far away from him and we needed a fresh start. In July of 2013, we found a home in Romeoville, but due to permits and the city, we had to wait to move in. A year had now gone by since he came into our lives. It was in August of 2013 that I noticed Brianna wearing a ring that I did not buy her. I knew it was from him. I made her take it off and put it away. Later we found out that somehow someone saw him come to my home late at night in a cab and give her this ring through a small bathroom window. He told her he had to serve time. He had to serve some time and that he wanted to marry her, so this ring was a symbol for her to wait for him. We found out later it was for abusing another girl. We finally moved to Romeoville in October of 2013. I didn't know he was, going, he was in jail at the time, but I did notice that she was acting like her old self and making an effort to do better. She started high school and made a few friends quickly. In December of 2013, I went to the school to attend a meeting with Brianna. When I got there, she quickly shared with me that she made contact with Eric using a friend's cell phone. She knew I would be upset, but she wanted to end things with him. I wasn't mad this time because I knew she was done. She said that he didn't believe she wanted to be over. She wanted it to be over, and he wanted the ring back. She told him she no longer had the ring. He called her horrible names and said he was going to come to our house and hurt us all. He said he would kidnap her and make her bleed. I wasn't afraid because I knew he was a coward but I wanted the police to do something. We went to the detectives in the school and explained the whole situation. He said what I had heard so many times before, get an order of protection. I explained how it never worked, but, I reassured, but he reassured me he would help me. He gave me copies of the text and we went to the courthouse, this time with Brianna. With Brianna by my side. The detective shared a picture of Eric with me by this time because I had no idea what he looked like. I called ADT and had an alarm system put on my house. I went to court a few times, yet he still was never served. About a month and a half had gone by with no word from him. The day that would forever change our lives was the morning of February 13, 2014, the day before Valentine's Day. It was my day off, which meant it was my turn to take them to school. 
Brianna woke me up earlier than usual because she wanted to pick up breakfast before school started. I started the truck from inside and we talked as we put on our shoes. I walked out first and she followed. I closed the door and we walked down the driveway. She always worried about how she looked. There was a lot of snow and ice, so I told her, be careful you don't fall. That's so not sexy. She gave me this look with her big, beautiful eyes and we both laughed. We got into the truck. I turned the heater on and went to grab my belt while she sat and watched me. I heard a loud noise and glass shatter. I didn't know what was happening, but I thought someone must have knocked on my window too hard, and due to it being cold outside, it broke. I remember being mad, but still not knowing what had happened, I turned my head to look in her direction and noticed the glass by her feet. I looked at her and she looked limp, as if she was sleeping. I still didn't get it. Outside of her window, someone was there, a man. He was moving the glass that was left with his arm. Then I saw it. It was a gun. I grabbed her and I pulled her toward me and lowered her to the middle console as much as I could to get her out of the way. I put my arm over her as he struggled with the gun. He covered his face with it while he pointed it at my head. At that moment, I thought he was going to kill me and no one would get to her in time. I was so scared and I still didn't understand who this person was and why this was happening. I begged him to stop and not to do this. I began to move my upper body and head around to try and dodge what was coming. Then it happened. It was so fast, all at one time. I felt a burn, heat, and my ears began to ring. I flew back and began to scream. My blood was gushing out of me. He ran. I held my horn down and screamed at the top of my lungs for my husband. I went in my purse and hit the panic button on my house alarm to alert the police. My neighbors heard me screaming. I told them to call 911 and that we had been shot. They called the police and went to get my husband. I was shot near my neck. I grabbed my wound and went around to her side. I opened the door and pulled her. and pulled her to a sitting position to see what had happened to her. She was moaning and her eyes were fluttering. She had glass all over her. And I didn't see any blood but mine. I told her that it was going to be okay and that mommy was with her. I remember screaming like a mad woman. I still didn't know. I still didn't know who would do this until an officer came and asked me if I had an order of protection on anyone and then it clicked. Everyone knew it was him but me. I never would have thought he would have done this. He said he loved her. Why would he do this to her? Why would he hurt her so bad? <laughs> we went in separate ambulances. I wanted to be with her, but I was also a victim. I, played, I prayed the whole time there. No one would tell me how she was. She was later airlifted to Loyola due to how severe her injuries were. Brianna was shot in the head. The next few days were a blur. 
I remember thinking that it was going to be okay. Brianna was going to come home. She would be sick, but she would come home. She may not be able to walk or talk again, but it was going to be okay. I would take care of her forever. I would be able to take my little girl home. That wouldn't happen though. They said there was nothing they could do. Eric chose to use a hollow point bullet which would explode on impact. Brianna had no chance. They said she was brain dead and that her organs would, be, would begin to fail. Due to a conversation Brianna and I had a few days before, I decided to donate a few of her organs. I donated her liver, kidneys, and her beautiful heart. I didn't know what the right choice was, but I knew who my daughter was. She was, she was a kind, loving, caring, and compassionate soul. She became a hero that week. She saved three lives, and I know she saved many, many more. A week later, we buried Brianna in a magenta casket with zebra print bedding, just like the bed in her room. Eric Maya was caught a few blocks from my home that day. He was hiding under garbage bags under a porch. How ironic. At the time of my daughter's murder, Eric Maya had a 15-year-old girlfriend he also met on Facebook. He also lied to her about who he was. It was something he had been doing for a while. He will never again do this to another girl. He was convicted later that year of murdering my daughter and attempting to murder me. He was given 122 years for what he did to us, yet it still gives me no comfort. He still says he's an innocent man. To all of you teens out there, I want you all to know how worthy you are. Truly love yourself before you love. Before you love someone else. When you are a child, you are not ready for this type of commitment. Focus on school and yourself. You have so much time to learn about life and relationships. Love isn't about control. It isn't about being told what to do where you can go, who you can be with, who you can talk to, or how you can dress. Love is when the person accepts you for who you are no matter what. Parents, as a mother I know life consumes us. We are so caught up in our obligations, we tend to miss little clues that our children need help. We need to stop and actually Listen to what our kids have to say, not yelling or judging. We need them to come to us and no one else. I sat Brianna down two months before she was killed. I told her whatever it is, stop and tell me. Mom, can we talk? I want to listen. She did. She would talk to me and cry. I would listen and wipe her tears. He took so much from her from me, from my family. One thing he can never take is the love that, I, that we have for her. I will never stop talking about Brianna or our memories, and I will do as much as I can to keep her name and her story alive in hopes of changing or saving a life. Domestic violence needs to stop, and we all need to speak up. This can happen to anyone. No one has the right to put your hands on you, and no one has the right to take your life. You don't belong to anyone but yourself. If you or someone you know is being hurt, speak up, say something, get help before it's too late. Thank you. We know that 
her story didn't end, have a happy ending. But we hope now that you've heard it, this isn't where the story ends anymore. That you take this and you use her pain to, to move forward and talk to your friends, get help, seek out your local domestic violence program, whatever you can do. Don't let Brianna's death be in vain. And now a song. It's time for our memorial service where we remember those who are no longer with us from the last 10 years. We march for those who cannot. We speak for the voices. We remember and honor them. In their names we march. We honor the women who cannot be with us tonight. Some women are afraid. They have been injured or intimidated. Far too many women have been killed. These are the women whose names are called out tonight. They are our mothers, our aunts, our sisters, our daughters, our family, our friends, and our coworkers. We also honor the children who have died with their mothers. 
Survivors, we honor you. You are not forgotten. You matter. You are important. And we value your presence here tonight. As we listen quietly, we ask that the spirits of our sisters who have gone before us be with us as a sign to other women who are afraid. We are with you. We hear your quiet voices. Empower us to give hope and strength and to provide peace and safety to women everywhere. Remember the names, listen for the voices. 2008, Ladina Height. 2009, Brittany Brooks. Monica Tamar. Angela R. Charles. Keisha Tate. Haley Burton. Nicola Williams. Sabrina Clement. Laquita S. Felton. Tashika Smith. 2010, Teresa E. McCauley. Nicole A. Rodriguez. Nevea S. Hunt. Carolyn Sadler. Nancy Mendoza Roja. Delena Krum. Baby Boy Abuelker. 2011. Kathleen A. Lewis. Wenlin T. Tida. Shirley Marzo. Two thousand twelve, Gloria Clark, Alicia N. Bromfield Anisich, Ava Lucille Bromfield Anisich, Cynthia Clark Long, Kathleen Savio. Dorothy Dunyan, Veronica Schick, Nermeen Sam, Two thousand thirteen, Diane Nichols, Jeannie Parker, Beatrice Osborne, Kier Hosey, Joan Smith. Alicia Coronel, 2014, Brianna Valley, Sharnithia Green, Jocelyn M. Woods, Two thousand fifteen, Tiana M. Wallace, Jordan Williamson, Ch 
Janicia Hill King. Laura V. Gonzalez. Susan Triple Cunningham. Triplet Cunningham. 2016. Jamie L. Willis. Diane Schreringen. Mary Siena. Jessica Janarian Thomas. Sequita M. Walsh. Destiny D. Tillman. 2017. Angel Martin. Cheris Friedman. Samaji Crosby. Reality Blue Rogers. Gina Rogers. Jaquita Rogers. Kia Johnson. Zaria Griffin. Michaela Hemming. Addison Hemming. Hemming. Gabriella Ruda. Elaine Z. Alicia Salazar. Two thousand eighteen Marissa Kozil Samantha Hare Jennifer Underhill Rebecca Kaziki Mercedes Flakes In closing, we honor the women who cannot be here with us tonight. We ask our sisters who have gone before us to give us strength and hope. We ask the gathered to remember their names. And we promise to be their voices. Before the march begins, we will have instructions from Amira. I'd like to take a moment to thank our volunteers for standing here for those who cannot. You may have a seat. So I hope we're now all feeling impassioned and emboldened to maybe yell out a little bit. 
It is time for our march. Before I tell you the route, I just want to remind you all, please be careful on the sidewalks. Look out for tree branches, uneven sidewalks. It is starting to get dark out because what are we doing? We're taking back the night, okay? Thank you. 